Well, from Galileo, he left us with this problem. How does a mass travel in orbit and, if it's like the heavens, keep traveling? See, they don't seem to have any access to power. What's the energy source? And just keep moving. Things keep happening in the solar system. And now they found galaxies that see in larger, hundreds and hundreds, thousands of times larger than the largest thing they'd ever known before. Well, the universe is vast, but see, we have no problem because God's the origin of it. If we have a finite tribal God, the larger the world, the smaller God gets. But the biblical position, the larger the world, the larger our perception of God gets. So if you just have a local God, you know, have a Sunday school picnic and going to camp a couple times a year, see, that's not the God that this world's about. So we need larger view. So, and Newton then, uh, the so-called universal law of gravity, Newton solved the equations, the mechanical equation, of how mass moves uniformly in orbit. Well, that's the astronomical revolution, but that's why these two men, he raised the problems that Newton solves. So that's between. See, these issues were highly impractical. What, what does this pretty falling body have to do with someone working in the fields of Europe or cleaning cow manure out of the barn every day? What does that have to do? See, it has no practical impact until the Industrial Revolution. But, See, his ideas have consequences, but immediately the ideas of these men had no practical daily bearing on people's lives. Say, well, must I, I've got to memorize that Galileo here, I've got to get hold of the Latin text of, of Newton, he wrote in Latin, and I've got to understand that because my life will be changed. See, the change comes from outside and forces different decisions about daily life and how we're to respond to, to the world. So we have in the West this, Aristotle, and this holds all the way up to Einstein, Planck, not Planck, but Planck, Heisenberg, and Greek names in, in uh, this is a, in the tens, 1910, 1920. Now, we're on the way to um, to a revolution in physics, and this will come to be called uh, quantum physics, quantum, and all of reality is reduced to quanta. The ultimate reality in this perimeter is reduced to, to uh, energy, light, energy, and that's a far cry from the materialism. See, the development in the rest, in the name of science here, it's not just that you've got a new car, or a new suit, or better, better material, see, or better food. We've got chemistry to tell you about a diet and, and vitamins and things. See, that's new information, but that's not evil to understand how things work. See, everything that science provides doesn't have direct catastrophe attached to it. So, materialism stems from a view uh, in the Newtonian world machine. Now that's not primarily Newton, but the world became interpreted, interpreted as a machine. And every part of the machine was causally connected. Now, because some have studied and read way past that, the first to do this will be the father of economic theory. The next to do this will be the father of political theory. The next will be social theory. Each of these perimeters of new study, the, the social sciences, eh, will operate on this assumption. And physics is the model. Well, if physics is the model, what can, they'll talk about the laws of economic, economic laws. They'll talk about, Laboule will talk about the laws of logic. They talk about the laws of economics. They talk about the law, political laws. 
You talk about the social law, socio-economic, political, Marx, you hear that coming? That everything can be scientifically examined, understood, and transformed. See, that's a worldview. It's a great deal more than just making claims about the world. So materialism and, uh, see, if matter by itself is evil or beauty, then God, uh, you know, created a monster. So it's over stewardship of matter that we must address. If God disliked beautiful things, he wouldn't have created beautiful things. Does that, that makes it, we have to address aesthetic architecture. If God wanted ugly Haydite block, uh, well, he would have made the world out of Haydite block. I believe that. See? But materialism, now this is the age of immateriality of matter. Now the 1920s, 1930s, and on into the 90s, and Bill's going to continue working in that field for the kingdom of God. But what it is, is not just information. It's not new detail, but immateriality of matter. Now that opens up the West, in the name of science, to new age. The things coming in to, from the West. For the first time in the history of the world, now this, this material is out, except for certain classes of people. But this material is coming in for the spiritual vacuum. See, so they're talking about spirituality. What does it have to do with creation? See, it's really not creation. It's the creator that we've lost. When we lose creation, that's why we'll take a little time about science. When we lose creation historically in the West, we begin to lose the creator and who he is. Then it affects every category of reality. That's why a Christian worldview should consciously control Christian education and not just that you be better and be a nicer person. See, in self-improvement courses. Now, Einstein and the fourth, the biological revolution, gave it a new model. See, I want you to keep a machine model in mind that the world is a machine. And then when biology in the middle to the turn of the 20th century, there's revolutions in biology, you get a biological revolution, you get a organismic. The world is an organism, a living organ. You hear that? How that's going to fit for new age and back us into animism again? Hmm? Yeah. 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 But you see, this comes out of all living systems the, are interfaced. And that will open up a worldview which is fundamentally for the access among the intellectuals. For, for a whole worldview uh, that's uh, brought the New Age phenomenon is so, uh, so constructive with this model. Or organism, if the world is an organism, then it's alive. Now, if it's alive in an organism, in an evolutionary model, then what is the reason for thinking that man is superior to any other species? See, we haven't heard the last in the 1990s of species prejudice. And uh, uh, there, there are technical books being written to defend that all species have equal importance in this giant organism. And it is human prejudice to think, see, the whole Christian perspective is collapsed right in, in, that, in, in that system. So, in these viewpoints, we still have this, we still have this, we still have this. Now, up till last year, we would have to have dealt more seriously with Marxism. Now, even liberation theology is mainly a lot of hot air because it hasn't changed anything, except more people are dead. But just a few months ago, we'd had to take in this more, more seriously, but the circumstances collapsed in, in Russia, in Poland, in Eastern Europe. See, it gives a lot. Seventy years is enough to try to see if that'll work out a system of life. Hmm? And if it has no internal renewal power, any system will get, you know, the body will get sick, but if it can't get well, you see, the test 
context is of a system is not when things are running nicely, but when things aren't running nicely, do you have a self-corrective instrument within it? Church, culture, civilization, nation. Do you have any power within that viewpoint to say, hey, we've got to get, we've got to change that? While people resist change personally and socially. Now, these are not all the worldviews, but technically, I'm lumping the West into three broad scientific viewpoints, and we still have these worldviews here. And that is the Aristotelian that controlled up to the scientific revolution, and the Newtonian worldview that controlled the world. 150 years of development in all the sciences operated on the assumption that Newtonian laws of physics controlled economics and politics and sociology and art and literature and music, that music was nothing more than the physics of sound waves. Well, that's a reductionism, isn't it? And if a rose is nothing more than what you can find the composition in a laboratory, something's odd about that because you can have all the chemical composition of a rose out here and not have a rose. Hmm? It's like a cadaver. You've got every, it looks like all the parts are still there. But something's missing, and that's what made the difference. The something isn't explained, and that's what the difference is. So, you can explain a whole lot, that's correct, but you can't explain what the difference is. And that's what bothers us. That was still maintained through the uh, biological revolution, wasn't it? Just different forms? Yes, yes. Now, we're getting, uh, if, if, uh, if, you, if this is new to anyone, a useful book we have in the library, Stanley Yecke, uh, is Relevance of Physics, has a chapter on each model, and just to get your feet wet, has a chapter on the organismic model, on the mechanical model of the world. This is what we're signed in the West. Now, people are still trying to say in China, that science has its origin in China. Books still say that science has its origin among the Greeks. That's a highly dubious claim. Now, certain types of activity that was called science was going on, there's no question about that. But whoever produces the scientific revolution produces the explanatory power of how things are. So science can now not merely theoretically explain something, but produce new knowledge. It, it has explanatory power and that it has predictive capability of getting knowledge that no one's ever had before. Metallurgy is more than just making swords. See, because you had good swords before you had metallurgy. Mm -hmm. huh? But you couldn't put equations down and heat equations and the computer couldn't say, well, now that it needs to be certain heat and the molecular structure, you know, that's the point at which the molecular structure is strongest. They didn't know anything about it. They just knew that no one in town could break it. But you get science when you say, I know why you can't break it. And that you and I can study that and everybody come up with the same answer under the same circumstance. It's not guesswork. So science is a different thing than gunpowder in China. You know, it's not science. It's technique. And the world operated on technique. They had better technique than most people in the world. I don't have any problem with that. Still does, see? How do you make porcelain? That's some of those beautiful things in the world. Layered porcelain by hand. You can go into shops and see people setting Lotus Lake from early in the morning till in the afternoon making that by hand. Well, you couldn't afford to pay them. If they belonged to Union, you wouldn't get one object because you couldn't afford this vase or you couldn't afford the thing that they made. It's a good thing they work for nothing or you couldn't have this great thing. Well, worldviews. Now what I want to do is talk about the concept of creation and changing physical theory. Now physical theory is the effort theoretically to explain nature. And some people would, and partly that's correct, they say, well, my, that sounds like philosophy. Then they say, well, that sounds like metaphysics, and we're beyond that after Kant. And, and then they'll say, that sounds scientific. And by scientific in the 19th century, they meant positivism. And now that science's development has liquidated positivism, we're in the what is now called postmodern period. 
postmodern means the world of the enlightenment and its assumptions have been refuted. The world of the enlightenment, see the enlightenment's the West. Now, where are we getting enlightenment talk from? Uh, yeah. Laboratories and universities. See, we're getting enlightenment from Hinduism and from Buddhism, enlightenment. New Age, enlightenment. Well, what can that enlightenment do? Well, help me cope. See, enlightenment used to be the, the metaphor for a new knowledge about the world. Enlightenment now means uh, that we study Buddhism so I can cope with the world. Managing stress. Ma stress management technique. Here are my three. An achievement of personal power. All right. Now, you see, it's an entirely different use. I'll clear on. Uh, well, let me go through that in here, but uh, what is physical theory? Now, in the history of physical theory, this is primarily about the West because the East has never had physical theory. Now, animism's physical theory is the world of spirits. Things move because of spirits, good spirits, bad spirits. So this is an animism, this is a pantheism. Rival spirits, and the best we get is not a resolution of rival spirits. See, the battle goes on eternally. See, it's never resolved. See, it just seems so ridiculous. Well, physical theory is the theory to explain how the physical world functions. Now, under that rubric, there are four periods of developing physical theory in the West. Again, because Islam has never done physical theory. I mentioned to you, I think, when I came back from, uh, from Toronto, one of our men has been working among the Muslims in Toronto, heavy Muslim concentration in Toronto, Canada. Uh, and for some reason, he had never ever studied, uh, you know, he was going to evangelize them, but he never studied on what made them tick. And uh, he needed some material because the thing that he hears from the Islamic intellectuals in Toronto is that Islam brought science to the West. What they brought was Aristotelianism. I sent him off stuff, but he'd never read it, but he'd been working with it for four years. Well, see, that's their key. They say, you say that Christianity produced science. We tell you historically that Islam, what Islam actually brought was superior Aristotelian text or Aristotelian science. That they didn't do. So all you have to do is even read what I tell you. You don't even need a Harvard PhD, see, in medieval science to, to get some response to them. And it's not a Christian prejudice. It's a historical matter. What did they do? Well, they, as a matter of fact, in the eighth century, when uh, when they invaded the West, they did have. We know now they had superior texts. The West had bad Latin translation of Aristotle. Didn't he have all of Aristotle? Now that's correct. There's no question that Islam. See, after the fact, you know it, but you have to have something to compare before you know it better. See? So they had. They kept alive the primary Greek text. But they did they were the originator of it. Oh, no, they never said they were the originator, but the, the thesis that they hear from the intellectuals is, you people say Christianity is the source, but here it's Islam that's the source. And therefore, whole systems of arguments, see, collapse, if that's the case. Okay. I said, you need to announce a one-year basic study of the history of medieval science. Well, that takes a textual matter. You have to study the text. Renaissance science. What was the nature of science in the period to see what they actually brought? See, it becomes a textual matter, not a prejudice matter. You know, no, we're better. No, we're better. No, you're better. No, the other guy's better. No, these are textual matters. And, I say broadly speaking, it's possible that science has its origin. But if it does, it has its origin in a fatalistic worldview. Well, but, but, well, you know, but Aristotle would have been considered an infidel. 
Well, so but not, not the philosopher. See, and, and Thomas Aquinas is Patrick and Kitty. And uh, 12th, 13th century. So, uh, you have to contextualize Thomas Aquinas. The fundamental context of the debate was Islam. And Islam claimed through Aristotle to prove the superiority of the Islamic faith with the same philosophical tools. And Aquinas, using the same philosophical tools that the Muslim philosophers used, Aristotle, that Christianity was superior. I'm not asking if you've read any of the classical resources of Aristotle, or, or, well, of Aristotle or Aquinas, but see, it was Augustine that looked at the doctrine of creation when he used Neoplatonism. It was Aquinas that we still have, the very expensive, about $100, two-volume commentary on Aristotle's physics. Well, why would anybody be interested in what Thomas Aquinas thought of Aristotle's physics? Because the very heart of the problem of physics is the origin of the universe. And it is a mark of the genius of both of these giant minds that they knew the fundamental issue in a Christian perspective is creation. And, you see, Augustine was in controversy with Greek thought that had no creation, and Aquinas was in confrontation with both pagan thought and Islamic thought. Over two volumes, still buy that. You still go over to Champagne if you don't have the money to buy. And, and look at Aquinas' commentary on faith. Why is he writing this enormous commentary? Because he's doing battle with a worldview. He's consciously dealing with a worldview. And not just determining the questione is the medieval methodology of education. You ask questions and answer. See, question and answer, it's a dialectical thing. You say, no, it's proposed that. And then he'll give reasons why you, you reject or accept that. It is proposed that. And he give reasons why that is not acceptable. Propose that. He goes through all the proposed solutions to problems and argues with them. Well, can you imagine carrying on education today like that? At Lincoln or anybody? See, going through all the alternatives and giving the weaknesses and the strengths of those positions. Well, most people say, well, how is that going to be practical? How am I going to be famous arguing with everybody? Well, See, physics, because matter is eternal, matter is eternal. And science comes along, and then progressively, that's what physical theory is, an effort to explain the nature and behavior of matter, which, broadly speaking, is what you do in physics and chemistry and biology. All right, four, four broad periods. First, one, is pre-kinetic Greek theory. Pre, I'll spell that P-R-E-K-I-N-E-T-I-C. Pre-kinetic Greek theories. Now, pre-kinetic from kinesis movement. There was no movement. Well, that violates common sense. We move, don't we? And uh, in philosophy, one philosopher says all is motion, and one says nothing is motion. Well, clearly that violates common sense. Everything is in motion, there is stability, and everything is static. There is change. So we still have those problems, don't we? Well, pre-kinetic meant that the Greek philosophers that denied that there was any motion. Now, what's at the heart of Galileo and Newton's physical breakthrough? Well, it's an explanation, not really a description of motion. Hmm? Motion. How can a body that weighs something move in orbit? We're talking about the heavens. And then we'll talk about rocks and missiles and things, but it's the physics that holds. Now Aristotle, he had a view that there were laws of the heavens, that was one set of laws, and laws of the earth. See, one set of laws, one set of laws, and Galileo to Newton in one fell swoop, heaven and earth was bound together in one set of law. The heavens behave the same way that the earth behaves. You don't have one, one physical theory for the heavens and one physical theory for the earth. So this is fundamental. See, four. Okay, pre-kinetic, that's an odd word. Two medieval theories, and that's the context of Christianity and Islam. 
because Islam, mid 8th century, was the greatest, greatest challenge, greatest challenge to Christianity up to that time, or certainly since the Gnostics, Islam. Three, classical, classical period, Galileo, G A L I L E O, Kepler, capital K E P L E R, and Newton. Galileo, Kepler, and Newton. That's the classical physics. And then fourth is the period where we're past this, actually. There's actually a fifth in the last 10 or 15 years. But Einsteinian relativity. And at uh, Los Alamos, they, they have international biggies come in talking about complexity. And they're gathering data to attack quantum physics. They're going to reduce quantum physics to a footnote and they said we're, we're rapidly having to return to classical physics to explain phenomena. <coughs> yes? It's not necessary. It's necessary for you, but it isn't necessary for our class. Yes. That the world is so complex that there's no finite amount of time. The world is so complex well, in, a, in a, a Christian, you might have a class in symmetry without talking about God. But how do you figure out how the world gets symmetrical? Well, it's design. But see, they think the design argument was overcome. They're ignoring it. See, but see, that's all philosophical. And symmetry is description, whether it is or not. So you need a class in symmetry. You're saying because of the complexity that they see in the universe and the structures that you're saying that would go against a finite amount of time? Yes. See, because if it, if just statistically, if it gets so complex and so interface, uh, it's like entropy, no finite amount of time, if entropy is a law, is, then in an infant, if the world's eternal, it ought to already disorder. So there's Well, it hasn't disordered, so what? See, notice you don't have evidence for that, sure. but you're deducing something from that entropy law. Because they believe in, in random in evolution, they're saying, well, because there's no creator, no designer, therefore we have to... Now, you see, and it's the hard-headed sign that we got failed here in the line, and we need hundreds like that. So, so the complexity, they're actually saying the complexity overrules all the thermal dynamics. Now, uh, the thermodynamics is just a part, you know, kind of uh, an equate, rather than controlling physics. That's how the people would talk a lot. About. Rather than controlling physics, we're rapidly moving, because we're here every day gathering data. This is not out of a five-year-old textbook. See, we're gathering data every day that the world is so complex that we're getting back into, it has to be structured. Well, that would fit. See, a Christian model, and that, the men that are talking like that are people who already believe in creation, but in the name of science, you can't talk like that. Well, the data is confirming the very, the very category of creation. But these men that are Christians that say, my world is going to have this complexity, they're not saying that thermodynamics has to be overruled. No, it's not overruling it, but see, instead of it dominating classical physics, it's, it's, it's being subordinated to a larger... Thing. It, it, you know, see, no one said, well, all of Newton's junk. No, Newton was correct within parameters. Did that? You still build railroads and houses on Euclidean geometry, I suppose. But there's no data to support it's just their science. How do I account for the complexity? How do I account for the complexity? But see, it was science in the West that lost us God. It wasn't fact. So the East has never had him, is one of the things. He's never had him. Which doctors in Africa have never had God, the creator of the universe? They're in control. Aren't they in control of that? How would you, for those of us that aren't here, Einsteinian relativity, how would you sum that up? Well, I'm, I'm the, the, the essence, the essence of this, uh, and I give you things to read. See, this model, the world's a machine, the ultimate philosophical consequences. I just sent her two new books on quantum mechanics uh, from Oxford yesterday, the library will have soon. So, uh, 
From Einstein forward, one cannot, in the name of science, affirm that the mechanical model is an exhaustive explanatory system for the universe. The mechanical model cannot be used as an exhaustive explanatory model. Now notice, the mechanical model has causality in it. Well, causality is what keeps rationality. See, logic is as causal as physics. Hmm? See, if, if in, in uh, math, in base 10, is that necessary? Well, if it's necessary, what is the status of its necessity? And Bill could do an experiment and say, this is necessary. See, giving the physics of this project. And that's just as necessary as the explanation of free fall. Or the law of gravity, centrifugal force. See, these things obtain because we go to forward and watch this enormous giant thing, and before it ever leaves its, its uh, house, it's doing 100 miles an hour, and within seconds it'd be done 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 17 plus thousand miles an hour before it orbits out of the Earth's atmosphere. What is the Earth's atmosphere? There's a pull in there. Have you ever seen it? Have you ever seen a pull? But you haven't seen the pull, you've just seen an object fall. And it doesn't explain why. And well, anyway, this, the, what happens here is a, is a limitation of this model. But it's this model that the historic origin in biblical studies that loses miracle. In the Tübingen School, David Friedrich Strauss and hermeneutics, that any appeal to supernatural breaks this scientific model. That goes through all standard, you know, real scientific commentaries and things. You can't both do science and bring in supernatural, bring in, okay? So the best supernatural help we get are the animus today, you know. Now, if, if, um, if machine model... Power count. If, 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 if machine model um, then gave uh, some philosophers a uh, view that we have a closed universe, and then Einstein perhaps says, well, maybe it's not so close. And then with quantum, we got everything reduced to energy, and UH is, you know, has an orgasm over that. But then the complexity, the complexity then kind of find the face of UH, and then you know, everything is superstructure. Yeah, there's no question about that. But high level practicing physics, not only in California, yeah. but specifically in Berkeley, are tr still traveling around the world. Mm -hmm. Not just in California or Illinois saying that contemporary microscopic physics supports New Age worldview. See, these aren't creatures, you know, mindless A, B, and Bible college creatures. These are practicing men that have PhDs in, in laboratory physics in major universities. Something like this. Huh? Right, but, it's, but could complexity be turned again? Oh, I beg no question. That's what a Christian friend that Los Alamos is saying. Yeah. That complexification, symmetry, see, flies in the face of complete disorder. To bring that kind of design. Yes. Yeah. But we lost the design argument in the 19th century, 18th and 19th century. So currently the danger is that we no longer have that design argument, so they're looking at some, they're looking at complexity almost as chaos. Right. Now that's, that's it, John. And I asked them down there, why do you call this complexity chaos? See, big, beautiful. Why, they've got signs up at Los Alamos that cost half of our budget. I'm, I'm talking about class signs, international biggies. It's probably $50,000 to have these two or three people come and speak on. I said, why do you use chaos? He said, well, we don't mean disorder. Said, why then, technically or practically, would you use chaos? Well, they said, we mean complexity. And see, the more complex something gets, to most people, it looks like chaos. It's too much for them. It's too much for them. So I understand what they're saying, but even from a scientific standpoint, they should get another term. But I do understand. When the bigger life gets, the bigger the world gets, it looks like chaos. Your wife comes over and all the new things. It looks like disorder because her ordering world doesn't seem to work. Huh? Does, that, does that make sense? 
In, but instead of chaos, it's, it's a bigger order. That, that's the very, the very thing. But it's important, see, for a Christian viewpoint. It's not enough just to go through the Bible. We need to do that. We need to do more of that, see, about creation. But we will not touch creation just doing the biblical doctrine of creation. And has anybody written on the implications of complexity yet from a Christian point of view? Uh, not that I know of. Uh, you know. We're talking about the last. Oh, oh, yes. See, this giant came and sent him into that. He goes, See, people who every day deal with know about it. Well, they just think, well, don't you know about it? Okay. And then they're hearing about it from the sources. Well, how long does it take if a person, now Bill has hired aspirating that, what if you just wanted to teach high school physics or freshman physics in college? What difference would that make? See, see, what, see, that runs through society. So I'm not talking about the West versus the rest. I'm, working, I'm talking about where and who has helpful ideas. That's all I'm talking about. This is not running down to any, anybody in the world, but some people just don't have the ideas to deal with the world. And some people do. Does that make any practical revivalistic sense? So the, the chaos. Um, what is it for them? Is it just is it still random? Well, it's larger and larger, but uh, you, you get the math, the equations you see, and it's ordered. But it's so massive, it looks like it's disordered. It, it, but, but now, but we said that the, the Christians are using to say back to support the theory. Yeah, you know, but see, the larger the world, that the physicists and the astronomers. Uh, new book you've got, uh, Jackie's book, God and the Astronomers. What, uh, what, Kid Cosmologist. Uh, that's what you ought to get. It's a 1989 book. Uh, I think he still had a copy there. Yeah. And uh, Stanley Yaki uh, gave uh, a Gifford lectures. He's a Catholic priest, Hungarian priest, but he, in my estimation, he is the best informed person that even operates out of any Christian assumptions of any kind uh, that's writing today. And, uh, but that's all he does. He doesn't teach, he just researches and writes and lectures, so. Uh, by the way, that's what at the University of Illinois, all high-level teachers are told that your primary purpose for being here is not teaching. Uh, we'll let the graduate assistants and the, and the you know, associate professors teach. You see the implications in that? Yeah. And your, your, your purpose is to do new things. Stay out of the classroom. You, you, you'll dissipate all your energy and what little brains you've got. Anything else will do that? Oh, yes. Well, that's what happened uh, 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 Carson. He uh -huh. writes a book every three years because he, he teaches two years and has a year leave of absence to go to Cambridge. Uh -huh. And money to bring in 10 or 12 people to have, to have uh, you know, papers ready for a book he's going to edit. So every three years, there's a book, minimum. See, because it's a procedure. Well, see, can you imagine our heritage paying for that? What are you doing? Writing dumb books. Okay. Since I'm a few decades, centuries behind, let me move back and ask a question. When it, it, the Einsteinian relativity opened up, you know, explained that the, the model, the machine model could explain everything, mm -hmm. but yet the damage was already done and we, were, we weren't there with creation. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. The cultural educational damage was already done. In a technical sense, now Bill and a few people like it, but know that that damage shouldn't be done. Well, we can't act like the damage is not done. It's in the textbooks. It's there. So we have to operate at different levels. See, we have to have people that are aware of that. Then you have to have people in the schools that counter what's in the textbooks. I, I told you, and it's about this whole issue of creation, uh, Bill Redman appeared before a, a Senate committee in New Mexico the chief, the chief, the, the man that writes the most biological textbooks in the United States for the major, for high school biology books, is a new ager down in Mexico. He's 80 years old now, and he's still planning on writing a new edition of some of his biology books. But he is a new ager to the hill, publicly, everything. And Bill went before the committee and asked, 
uh, just for Rejonda. And the state, the politicians in New Mexico, this is not a revolutionary hotbed in New Mexico. And they just said, well, it's a matter of opinion. And he said, well, all we want is some pages or some paragraphs in a book that there are other ways of looking at it. Well, since you don't write the textbooks, we'll put in it, and that's what, that's what he was told. But they did, uh, did allow him to come for a Senate committee on textbook writing. But the biology, but see, it's in, we have damage, that's damage controls at different levels. But if we don't ever have what's going on, we'll be damaged irreparably. And that's over education and whether you need seminary and, and whether you need practical ministries, how to baptize a fat woman or, uh, you, you know, what to do in case of this and this and this. And you have a book that says, what am I supposed to do under these circumstances? See, and the church is at different levels, needs, needs insight uh, for children in school, for the textbooks, for what's going on. Well, it doesn't take five years to be so far behind that you can't catch up even when you know what you're doing. Isn't that right there? Even when you know what you're doing, it doesn't take two or three years to be so far behind. I'll never catch up. And then an emphasis on daily pragmatics precludes ever dealing with that. See, the increase of knowledge is so rapid. Most people say, well, I don't even want the knowledge that I've got, and you're trying to give me more. You, you know anything about that in seminaries and classes and things? So, now why? It's over creation. And this is just a step ahead of uh, just kind of evangelistic preaching. Now in pre-kinetic Greek theory, Greek, the outlook among the Greeks in this first period, let me give you a word and then tell you what it means if it's strange to you, was well, monism. Now that means the one, that reality was of one, and therefore, it's kind of like the, these, these, dual, I'll show you that in the dualism business. Now, what is New Age? What is New Age in its pantheism? What it means one. See that? See that right there? That's back. It's back. See, it was back in materialism. But in another category, I'll show you. Monism, now in the monist outlook, all things are forms, it's monism, all or every. Is formed by one substance. Okay? What is that? Creation, mind, spirit, matter, the earth. I, I don't need to go through Thales and Aximander if you want these things. I, I will have philosophy classes do that, but it, this is this is essential. This is a viewpoint, and it's in in my uh, uh, classical to medieval philosophy syllabus in the library. But uh, a couple stuff. If you have need for a very important practical tool, now the the large three volumes. It's $69. See, it's a $200 set of books been put in these large, uh, we use that when we had philosophy more regularly here, Copleston. C-O-P-L-E-S-T-O-N. Copleston. Now, th th that, you think that's in there, John? Maybe. They have things like that in, in there. Well, I'm not looking up books, but monism. Now, monism, this is Greek. Now, the Greeks, this is from 5th century B.C. But monism is back in our culture. It's one thing to say, well, what do I need to know about Thales or Anaximander? Well, there is a sense in which you don't. Hmm? So this is you can live a long time without having heard about earth, air, fire, and water. That's not a singing group, see? Matters eternal. Right? Yeah, correct. See, no one in the East, no one in the